of rights versus privileges. Now, the Texas Constitution has several uh, articles in it, and the very first article very first article in the Texas Constitution is the Bill of Rights. Why is the Article 1 the Bill of Rights? Because that's the most important thing and the rest of the Constitution should support that. Right. Why do we have any government? Why don't we just say, well, let's get rid of government, we'll just have an anarchy. Why do, why do we have any government at all? What's the purpose of government? Protection. To protect your rights. The Declaration of Independence says that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. So that uh, the purpose of government is to secure the rights. Well, in a hypothetical situation, let's assume that we all love each other, we're all friends, we just, you know, hug and sway back and forth and sing Kumbaya. All right? If everybody loves each other, there's nothing for the government to do. It's only when I back over your mailbox and you want to start beating my brains out with a baseball bat that the government steps in and says, well, wait a minute, you know, let's settle this peacefully. That's the only purpose for government. So, if you're going to have a constitution for Texas, the purpose of that government is to protect your rights. So you have to list what rights are being protected. That's why almost every state constitution lists the Bill of Rights first. The U.S. Constitution was basically backwards. They wrote the Constitution and they went, oh gosh, we kind of forgot. And so they added a Bill of Rights at the end. You know, kind of like a, a patch on the end, even before it really got, got started. Now, so, um, if I have a right to do something, I don't require permission. So if I have a right to keep and bear arms, then I don't require a concealed carry permit. They are contradictions in terms. Did George Washington and Thomas Jefferson have gun permits? No, it was ridiculous. I mean, you were required to have a gun, basically, to, to defend the United States. So. If they didn't have a gun permit, and we do now, where was the first gun permit? When did we write the first gun permit? Just after what we call the Civil War. It's actually the war between the states. If you have a right to do something, you don't have to ask for permission. White people had rights. Black people were slaves. They had no rights. Well, we passed the 13th Amendment, which says there's no more slavery. Well, gosh, if there's no more slavery, then blacks and whites are all the same, right? right. So you're going to give the black people guns after you've just had them in chains? And I don't think so. They may be a little upset with us. <laughs> <laughs> Giving them a gun may not be a real good idea this week. And so, what we did was we gave blacks privileges. Okay? Well, this guy's not going to be really angry with it. We'll let him do it, but not this guy over here, because I can still see in his eyes, he's angry. So, blacks were given privileges with the 14th Amendment. How about a marriage license? Did Thomas Jefferson and George Washington have a marriage license? No. Today, just about everybody has one. Where was the first marriage license? Right after the Civil War. If two white people want to get married and have children, they have a right to do that. They can do anything they want with their property. Now, whites don't have to ask anybody for permission. Blacks were, but we really didn't care. Two black people wanted to get together. We basically considered that animal husbandry. Ah, but what if a black person and a white person want to get married? Oh gosh, we can't have that. We can't allow a mixing of the races now, can we? The white person can do anything they want. 
The black person can't. The black person has to get permission. So the first marriage licenses were permission for interracial marriages. And I have a copy of Black's Law Dictionary. Now this is Black's Law 3rd edition. This is about uh, 1870s, I think, somewhere in that time frame. And so it's an old book, and I, I've gotten a copy of it, and I've looked up marriage license. And it says, quote, a, a license or permission granted by public authority to persons who intend to intermarry. Right there in black and white. A marriage license is for mixed marriages. Well, eventually that was working so well that we just apply a marriage license to everybody. Why do you need permission? If you go to a wedding, how many people are in that contract? Well, you got the man, you got the woman, but that's not all. You've also got the state. The state is there giving you permission. Why? Because you asked. If you asked for permission, that's pretty good evidence that you needed permission. Why would you ask for permission if you don't need it? So you've got the man, the woman, and the state. There are three entities in this contract. So now the state has a vested interest in the outcome of this contract. Well, what is the general outcome of a marriage contract. You put a boy and a girl in a dark room for long enough, what's going to happen? Children. So now, the state, because they are vested in this contract, they have a vested interest in the children. How can this uh, social worker come to your door and say, you're not being a good parent, and take your kids away? Because they own them. If you have a marriage license, the state has partial ownership in your children. That's how they can demand that your children go to school. They want their children in school, government schools. Now, if you don't get a marriage license, you know, if you just say, hey, you're pretty good looking, you want to sleep together? What do they call that? That's a common law marriage. That's probably the only phrase where anybody knows the phrase common law. Well, what is common law? Well, gosh, I don't know. That's what two people know. It's not. Two people get married. It is a common law marriage because it is based on property. And we will get to Article 3 of the Constitution later this afternoon, and we will go into the levels of law in great detail. All right. Now, let's turn to page 6. And I want to bring up another concept. This is the concept of sovereignty. Sovereignty is the idea that you don't have to ask permission. You are the top banana. There's nobody to ask. I'm it. I am the decision maker. Now, uh, sovereignty is defined as the status, dominion, power, or authority of a sovereign. Royalty, supreme and independent power of, or authority in government. Now, back in, let's say, you know, the early 1700s or late 1600s, who was the sovereign in England? The king. The king. He was the sovereign king. That's basically the only time we understand that word is the sovereign king. Well, this, the, how did the king become sovereign? Well, there was a general idea referred to as the divine right of kings. Somewhere along the line, God smacked this guy in the head with his royal scepter, and he became the king. He had all of the rights because he had all of the property. Who owned England? The king. It was his country. He owned it. Okay? And, you know, he just happened to be born to the right person, you know, grew up in the right family, and they crowned him king. And everybody's going, okay, this is your land. Now, the king had all of the rights. All the people who live in England are subjects. They get privileges. 
If I'm the king, I'm going to give you the privilege of being the royal baker. And I'm going to let you be the royal blacksmith. And you can be the royal candlestick maker. It's a privilege. And I may not give it to anybody. You may be the only candle maker in the entire little shire. Isn't that great? No competition. Except if you piss me off, I'm going to take that privilege away from you. So the king had all of the power and would give out privileges to all of his subjects. Now, a lot of us got in boats, came to North America, and we started you know, building our houses here. Eventually, we signed the Declaration of Independence. What is the Declaration of Independence? It is a letter to King George. And in so many words, we told King George to put it where the sun doesn't shine. We no longer work for you. We are sovereign and independent. Instead of all this, uh, instead of you getting all this uh, power from God and then giving it out to us willy nilly, we are going to cut out the middleman. We're not going to have a king anymore. God is going to endow us with the rights. We've got the unalienable rights. Directly from God. We don't need you anymore. And furthermore, when we finished with the Revolutionary War, we got a lodial title. Who owned North America prior to the Revolutionary War? The king. He sent his people in the boats. They set up a flag. Said, I hereby declare this land property of the king. Well, guess what? We took our property and said it belongs to us. We have rights. We have property. First time in human history. Amazing. So, we've got the uh, Declaration of Independence basically, which severs all of our ties with the king and makes us sovereign citizens. We've got all the power. Now this is such a, an incredible change in the way that everything was going that they had to go back to England and explain it. Now, the uh, William Pitt was one of our guys, and he went back to England after the Constitution was uh, ratified, and he went to the House of Commons, basically Parliament, and he explained the way the situation was now. And he said, quote, the poorest man may, in his cottage, bid defiance to all the forces of the crown. Can you imagine living in England and bidding defiance to the king? What happens when you tell the king, no? You end up being short. <laughs> you have no place for a hat. <laughs> you never tell the king, no. But here in the United States, people, the poorest man, may bid defiance to the king. Now we're talking about the uh, shack. It says it may be frail. Its roof may shake. The wind may blow through it. The storms may enter. The rain may enter, but the King of England cannot enter. All his forces dare not cross the threshold of the ruined tenement. So how much power does the King have in the United States? Zip. None. Nada. Who's in charge? We are. We have... 285 million sovereign citizens in the United States. 285 million kings and queens. If I own my land, I make the law. This is Badnarik's law. Now, I only have a little tiny kingdom. You know, a couple thousand square feet. I can't come next door and make laws in your kingdom. That's your kingdom. You make the laws there. But here... I'm the king. It's good to be king. <laughs> right? Being sovereign doesn't mean, oh, I've got, I've got this really great recliner so I can watch the uh, Super Bowl. It means you are sovereign. You have nobody to answer to but yourself. 
and your queen standing next to you, and, you know, whatever she says. But, but that is basically the general idea. Now, the Constitution says, we the people ordain and establish the Constitution. When we the people wrote the Constitution, we create Congress. Now, if we create Congress, who works for who? Do they work for us, or do we work for them? Now, as far as I can tell, they're supposed to work for us. Now, there is a, uh, a presumption of law that predates the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was signed in 1215. So even before that, it was understood that the created can never be higher than the creator. If I make something, I've got to be more powerful than that because I created it. You know, my father used to tell me when I was a boy, I brought you into this world, I can take you out. That's how we should respond to Congress. Who, how did Congress show up? Has it always been there? No. We invented Congress. We, the people, created Congress. And if we don't like it, we can take them out. We can abolish Congress and start over from scratch if we, the people, feel that's what we need to do. We have sovereign power. Everybody say, it's good to be king. Come on, everybody. It's good to be king. You gotta at least say it. Doesn't that feel good? Don't you feel a little bit of your liberty and rights coming back? So, um, on page seven and eight, I have uh, gotten permission from uh, another patriot out on the internet who pr uh, you know prefers to remain uh, remain anonymous. But it is a two-page article on what is a sovereign individual. And I genuinely recommend that you read that, in fact, probably at the next break. But it goes on to say that there are different levels of sovereignty. The first level is mental sovereignty. You at least have to think of yourself as a king. You've got to wake up in the morning and go, it's good to be king. If you don't think it, you're never going to get the other kind. Now, the second form of sovereignty is financial sovereignty. You've got to get all of your stuff, all of your property protected so that the bad guys can't take your property away. And then, eventually, physical sovereignty. That's where, I mean, we're actually there. Nobody's going to mess with you because they recognize that you're the king. We're not there yet. We are struggling to get there, but it is a struggle. And again, for some people, you may not want to struggle that hard just yet. But um, go through and read that at your earliest convenience. Again, maybe the first next break or uh, through lunch. And uh, that will give you a really good idea of what sovereignty is. So now, I have... I have a, a political question. I'm on page 9 of your handout at the top of the page. <coughs> the, the philosophical question is, if we the people are sovereign, do we have the authority to violently overthrow the government if necessary? Yes. Yes. Now that's, that's kind of a dangerous question even to ask because you're automatically labeled an extremist and a radical. Well, so was Patrick Henry. Give me liberty or give me death? Doesn't sound like he's sugarcoating it. Uh, now, the Declaration of Independence. If you haven't read the Declaration of Independence recently, do so. It is probably the most wonderful document written by humankind. And part of it says that the reason for our, our government is that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, that when any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. Not just tyrannical governments, but any government. Democracy, republic, if it's not working for you, 
get rid of it. That uh, governments long established should not be changed for light or transient causes. You don't want to overthrow the government just because you got another parking ticket. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and provide new guards for their future security. So not only do you have a right to overthrow the government, but you have a moral obligation to do so. Ever been to the mall and had somebody else's kids running all over the place swinging from the chandeliers? You know, they're just being a royal nuisance. Haven't you ever wanted to just go over and slap the parents? <laughs> Who's responsible for those little monkeys that are causing everybody else grief? The mom and dad. And if they are not, you know, responsible for their children, they are the ones that ought to get slapped. And the kids probably ought to be reined in a little bit too. Who's responsible for Congress? We the people. And if Congress is in Washington, D.C. doing all sorts of vile and evil things, who's responsible? We the people. We've got nobody to you know, blame but ourselves. We have been rotten parents. And it's time that we grabbed our brat and shook it by the shoulders and put it back in its place. Now, if you think I am radical, <laughs> let me share with you some thoughts from some of the Founding Fathers. Thomas Jefferson said, and this country with its institutions belong to the people who, oh, excuse me, Thomas Jefferson, and what country can preserve its liberties if its rulers are not warned from time to time that this people preserve the spirit of resistance? Let them take arms. The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Right? We are talking bloodshed if necessary. Abraham Lincoln. This country with its institutions belongs to the people who inhabit it. Whenever they shall grow weary of their existing government, they can exercise their constitutional right of amending it or their constitutional right to dismember or overthrow it. He also said, we the people are the rightful masters of Congress and the courts. Not to overthrow the Constitution, but to overthrow the men who pervert the Constitution. How do you know if the Constitution has been perverted if you haven't read it? Let me give you a little commentary on the Holocaust. The Holocaust is generally deemed to be the worst travesty in human history. Five or six million Jews. I don't know what the, uh, the actual count was, but it was a lot of people. They did a genocide. They tried to wipe out an entire race. Hitler did not take Germany by force. He did not drive in with army tanks. Hitler was elected. Anybody have any idea what the vote count was? What his percentage of the total was? 98% in Austria-Hungary. That's just about everybody. Everybody voted for Hitler because he was going to solve all their economic problems. Did Hitler get elected on Monday and start throwing people into ovens on Friday? No. It was a gradual process. The first thing that Hitler did was start to write newspaper articles. Every, everything that was going wrong was the Jews' fault. They're the ones that caused all these problems. Did the Jews write their own newspaper articles and go, I disagree? Well, not that I can think of. I've never read any newspaper articles that you know, contradicted any of that. So then the Jews had to wear the Star of David so we can tell who you are. Did they say, no, that's a violation of my property, privacy. I don't have to tell you whether you know, I'm Jewish or not. No. The Jews decided, well, it's a religious symbol. We love God. We should be proud 
to wear the Star of David. Eventually, the, Jew the Germans came in and they broke all of the windows in all of the Jewish businesses in one weekend. The, the Saturday night was known as Kristallnacht, which is German for night of glass. You couldn't walk up and down the sidewalks because they were filled with glass. Did the Jews rise up and say, now damn it, you're violating my property, you shouldn't do that. No. Gosh, we don't want to make the Germans any madder than they already are. We want to just kind of go along to get along. Don't piss them off. They've got guns. Eventually, the Germans are loading them up in the cattle trailers, in the, on the train. Where do you think you're going? On vacation? Where do you think they're going to take you? Well, now you're cold and naked and they're walking you into the ovens where you're going to go to mass execution, is it time now to raise your hand and say, you know, I tend to disagree with all of this. Bang! You're dead. It's too late to complain. You should have complained at the beginning when you at least had a chance. My question to you, and I don't expect you to answer it, just think about it in your head. How bad do things have to get before you do something? Do they have to take away all your property? Do they have to license every activity that you want to engage in? Do they have to be throwing you on cattle cars before you start to say, now wait a minute, I don't think this is a good idea. How long is it going to be before you finally resist and say, no, I will not comply. Period. That's a different answer for each person. Ask yourself now, because sooner or later you're going to come to that line, and when they cross it, what are you going to say, well, okay, cross this line. Okay, now cross that line. Okay, now cross this line. And pretty soon, you're in a corner. Sooner or later, you've got to draw a line and stand your ground. Whether anybody else does or not. That is what liberty is all about. Now, let's go on to talk about different forms of government. Now, government... George Washington said that government is not eloquence, it is not reason, it is force. And like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. Basically, he admits that we need some government. I mean, if you're going to cook your food and stay warm, you need fire. But you've got to keep it under control. If it gets out of control and you catch the forest on fire, where are you going to live? Now, government is power. It is the authorized use of force. Now, depending on where that power comes from, we have different forms of government. The first form of government was monarchy where one person has all the power. That was the king, the emperor. It's good to be king, because you don't have to answer to anybody. Now, if the king wants to create a law, does he you know, ask people for their opinion? Does he send it out for a vote? No, he just signs the proclamation, ta-da, I have a law. And you've got two choices. You can either follow the law or dance on the end of a rope. That's a monarchy where all the power is in one person. Now, if we take the power and shift it out a little bit to a small group of people, you have an oligarchy, also known as an aristocracy. Us and them. We make the power, we make the rules, and you follow the rules. Isn't that great? Guess what? If I am making the rules, all the rules are going to benefit me. 
and you are going to be on the short end of the stick, as they say. That is an oligarchy. Forms of oligarchy are socialism and communism, where they make the rules and you've got to follow them. Now, let's take that power and spread it out just a little bit more. Now, everybody has power. That's called a democracy. That is rule by the many. Now, democracy is majority rule. Isn't that great? How many people want to vote for democracy? Well, in a democracy, what they don't tell you is that the minority loses. You have no rights in a democracy. You only have privileges which are granted to you by the will of the majority. So if most of us vote, we will let you keep your house. Otherwise, we're going to take it away from you. Let's assume that all of us are landowners and we all have about the same amount of land. And John here has land with water on it. And I, I want some of the water. So I, want, I go to John and I ask John if he'll sell me his land. And John says, no. No, it's been in my family for six generations. It's my grandfather's and great-grandfather's. Just don't want to sell it. And well, okay, we're a democracy. And so I'm going to put it up to a vote. I'm going to vote that we take John's land and divide it up. Everybody gets a little piece of John's land. How many people want to vote for John's land? Right? Okay, John, you get to vote because this is a democracy. Right. Right? You lose. Right. Mob rule. Mob rule. That's exactly what democracy is. The founding fathers loathed a democracy. They hated democracy. They called it tyranny of the majority. Now, Al uh, Alexander uh, Fraser. Uh, Titler said that a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves largesse from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates promising the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that a democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy and followed always by a dictatorship. The average age of the world's greatest civilizations has been 200 years. How long has the United States been around? About 225 years. Anybody kind of see sort of a correlation there? The United States government is basically going down the tubes very quickly if we don't stop it and get people to stop thinking of this as a democracy. Oh, people don't think of this as a democracy. I hear it on the news all the time. You watch you know, all these uh, network news stations so you go, well, we've got to make the world safe for democracy. I don't want to make the world safe for democracy. I want to eliminate democracy. What type of government do we have? Republic. We have a republic. We just pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic for which it stands. Go to Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution. The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. It's not a debate. I can point to it in black and white. The question is, what's a republic? Don't we get to vote? Yes. Aren't we a democracy? No. How is a democracy different than a republic? In a republic, it is based on individual rights. It is based on property. In a republic, we can vote on everything except your property. In a republic, the right and property of the minority is supposedly protected. So if my little group here is a republic and I want to take John's land, 
The purpose of the Republic is to say, no, that's not your land. That's John's land. Even if all of us want John's land, the government is supposed to step in and protect John. The right and property of the minority is protected from the majority. So one person and the law will overrule 285 million votes in the United States. It's not yours. There are certain things you don't get to vote on. That's the difference. And every time you hear them say democracy on TV, pick up the telephone and call them in your most aggravated voice and say this is not a democracy. This is a republic. Now, we have democracy spelled with a small d. And we have republic spelled with a small r. Those are forms of government. Those are not political parties. We have a democratic party spelled with a capital D, and we have a Republican Party spelled with a capital R. But they have no correlation whatsoever to democracy and republic. They are just forms of government. Each one of those parties wants a certain part of your liberty. Now it's a generalization and I know that we can find exceptions. However, in general, the Democrats say, you can think anything you want. You have all sorts of rights. You want to read Playboy? Go ahead. You want to have abortion? Go ahead. All that stuff is okay. The problem is, it's not your money. We're going to take your taxes, and we're going to spend your taxes for you. I mean, you're just too busy to decide how to spend all that money. So we're going to take your money and we're going to spend it for you on all these really good causes. Now, the Republicans say, no, 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 that's not right. That's your money. You should keep your money. But you should think like we do. We want you to be white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, Christian, you know, go to church. We want you to look like us. We want you to think like us. That Playboy magazine is evil. No, and we want to control the way that you think. Which one are you willing to give up? Are you willing to give up your money, or are you willing to give up your mind? Which party do you want to vote for? None of the above. Now, one of the things that they have done is they've lied to us. They, they changed the question so that both answers are bad. If I ask you, do you still beat your wife? Are you going to answer yes or no? no? Yes, yes, I do still beat my wife, or no, I don't still beat my wife. The question implies that you did beat your wife at one point in time. If they ask me, I can't answer the question. It's not yes or no, I'm not married, I've never had a wife. But you have to be careful that you don't take the question for granted. One of the things that we take for granted, they ask you, whenever you talk about politics, they ask you, are you right wing or left wing? Are you Democrat or Republican? Why are those the only two choices? Are you going to vote for Hitler or Stalin? Are you going to vote for the electric chair or lethal injection? Um, now, in the back of your book, there's a little tiny card it's called the world's smallest political quiz. One of the things that it does is to eliminate the fallacy that everything is left or right. There is also up and down. Now, Hitler was a totalitarian. Hitler wanted to control your mind and your money. You have no control. The state or the government has all the control. He's on the bottom of a little diamond shape. Now the Democrats want to control your money but not your mind. So they are on the left. The Republicans want to control your mind but not your money. So they are on the right. If you are on the top, 
where you want to control your own money, you want to do your own thinking, then you are a libertarian. You believe that you are smart enough to spend your own money. You are smart enough to, to decide for yourself where you, whether you want to read Playboy. Pornography is in the eye of the beholder. You're, you know, adult. You know, make your own decisions. So, stop thinking as everything left and right. Think of everything as two-dimensional. Left, right, up or down. Where do you want to be on the playing field? And you can answer these ten simple questions, and it you give you a score, and it will let you know basically where you stand. Now, let me give you a little uh, anecdote that I, I developed to talk about the difference between the Republican Party with a capital R and a republic, which is a form of government, with a small r. Let's say that I walk into the room, and I have a pet. And my pet is under my arm, and it's going, bark, 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 bark. And you say, what's your pet's name? And I say, my, na my pet's name is Dog. Now, my pet is a dog with a small d, but I've also given him a name. And his name is Dog with a capital D. And so I take my dog with me. And so for several years, this dog is my pet dog. Now my dog dies, and I go out and I get a new pet, and I come walking into the room with a new pet, and I've got my new pet under my arm, and my, my new pet is going, meow, meow, and you say, what do you call your pet? And I say, I call my pet Dog. This is Dog 2, but I like the name so much I just kept the name. So now... I call my, my pet dog with a capital D. What is it? Is it a dog with a small d? No. The name has nothing to do with the animal. The Republicans with a capital R have nothing to do with the Republic with a small r. They've just kept the name. They are voting away all of your rights. Now, People say, well, I don't want to vote for one of the smaller parties because I don't want to waste my vote. I would rather vote for one of the guys that's going to win. And I'm going to ask you again, do you want to vote for Stalin or Hitler? Because those guys are going to win, they're going to get most of the votes. Is there anybody here whose mother did not ask them, if all your friends jump off a cliff, are you going to jump off too? <laughs> Isn't that stupid? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. If you think that the United States is in trouble and you go back to vote and you vote Democratic or Republican just like you've always done thinking that you're going to fix it, you are insane. You are crazy. Call the men in the white coats, and we'll have them come and pick you up. If you want things to be different, you have to do something different. I don't care which party you vote for. I really don't. Just don't vote Democratic, and don't vote Republican. <laughs> vote for anybody else. If you vote Democrat or Republican and 98% of the total goes to them, they go, well, things are the same. You know, we got, you know, the will of the people. They don't want anything to change. You say, well, yeah, but if I vote for the Libertarian, he's never going to win. Well, no, if you're not if you don't vote for him. But if you vote for him, and let's say he gets 20% of the vote, is he the president? No. But whoever is president is going to go, wait a minute, this guy got 20% of the vote. I'm going to go stand over there and do a little bit more what he was doing. They're going to have to pay attention to you. Have we ever had a socialist president? Well, <laughs> nobody on the socialist party. We've never had somebody from the socialist party elected as the president. But they didn't have to. 
They just started the Socialist Party of America and they just keep putting out all these ideas and getting votes. And so the Republicans and Democrats have both been becoming more and more socialist. How many people remember Franklin Delano Roosevelt? He may not have been on the socialist ticket, but Roosevelt was a socialist. He went to England, which is the center of all socialism in the world, and he learned to be a socialist. He got elected in 1932, and all of his New Deal is socialism. You like my dog? Meow, meow. Are you going to be fooled if I change the name? No. And it's a cat. So then why are you so surprised when they call it the New Deal, and I go, it's socialism. How can you be fooled so easily? Any questions on the different uh, forms of government or the different political parties? Now, on page 11, there are different implementations of those different forms of government. If I have a totalitarian government, it is a monarchy, by definition. Fascism is a form of dictatorship. Fascism is a government system led by a dictator, or a monarch, having complete power, forcibly suppressing of opposition and criticism. Forcibly forcibly suppressing opposition. Does that sound like freedom of speech is alive and well under fascism? No, you have no freedom of speech. In fact, if you say anything that the government doesn't like, you're going to disappear about 2 o'clock in the morning and nobody's ever going to hear from you again. Now, uh, Stalinism is another form of government. Well, Stalin was an American ally. You know, we don't want to piss him off. And so, even though he was a fascist, we don't want to call him that because that might be a little embarrassing. You know, he was our buddy. And so we invent a new name. We call it Stalinism. Well, the dictionary correctly defines it as uh, a, an ideology characterized especially by the extreme suppression of dissident political or ideological views. What does exp uh, extreme suppression mean? <coughs> That's pretty well suppressed. Stalin is guilty of killing 25 to 35 million of his own people. Now, I don't condone what Hitler did, but at least he was going, well, it's those guys. Hitler was trying to kill all the other guys. Stalin was killing our guys. And he killed six times as many. Why is Hitler the worst guy in history? How come it's not Stalin? Well, he's going to be our buddy. We always saw him sitting on the boat with, you know, FDR. And Winston Churchill. He was one of the big three. Well, that must mean that, you know, Stalin's a good guy because they're all alike, right? Well, I agree that they're all alike. Socialism is a theory or system of social organization which advocates the vesting of the ownership and control of the means of production uh, in the community as a whole. So do you have any property under socialism? No. It's not your car. It's our car. And we are letting you use it. It is not your house. It is our house, and we have, you know, we're going to volunteer to let you borrow it. Do you have any property in socialism? No. If you have no property, guess what? You have no rights. Where do rights derive from? Property. Communism is a theory or system of social organization based on the holding of all property in common. It's not yours. That's why communism is bad. That's why we're against socialism. 
Not because they've got a red flag or because they march funny. Because they're taking all of your property away. And when they take all of your property away, they take away all your rights. Let's flip to the next page. Well, let me stop and do a quote from Winston Churchill on page 11. Winston Churchill said, if you are 20 years old and you are not a socialist, you have no heart. If you are 40 years old and you are still a socialist, you have no brain. <laughs> now, what's, what's Churchill trying to tell us? Well, if you're 20 years old and you're listening to the advertising for socialism, what does socialism say? We're all going to have health care. We're all going to have education. We're going to just live together. Everybody's just going to share everything. And we're all going to sing Kumbaya. Socialism is wonderful. How many people want to vote for wonderful socialism? Well, when you're 20, yeah, you're idealistic. We just want everybody to love each other. Isn't that great? Where's all that health care coming from? Where's all that free education coming from? Well, the government, where does they get the money from? Oh, oh, I finally figured it out 40 years later. That's not very much fun. So when you're young and stupid, socialism sounds like a great idea. When you finally grow up, hopefully not too late, socialism sucks. Let's go to page 12. I have the entire Communist Manifesto summarized here on page 12. Now, in the middle 1800s, somebody asked Karl Marx, what would you need if you were going to start a communist government from scratch? Just clear the playing field, blank slate, you're going to build it from the ground up, what are you going to need? What are the things that you would want to have in order to make this a perfect communist government? The Communist Manifesto is the answer. It's not very long. Basically just a term paper. Read it. Why? Because I want you to be a communist? No. I want you to know how they are attacking you. You have to understand the enemy. The ten planks of the Communist Manifesto. Plank number one. Abolition of private property. No property, no rights. If I stand up on a soapbox and I say, I'm going to start a government where I'm going to take all of your rights away, how many people are going to volunteer? Nobody with half a brain. So now Karl Marx stands in a box and says, I'm going to start a new government and we're going to take everybody's property away. They're signing up like flies. I mean, they're just, yeah, yeah, pick me, pick me. <laughs> you know, that basically the problem is you don't understand that property and rights are related. If they take your property, you have no rights. And once you understand it, then you understand why communism is evil. It's not just a personal opinion. It's evil. We're taking your rights away. Now, the other nine planks to the Communist Manifesto are basically just methods for doing the first thing. How are we going to take your rights, uh, property away? Well, number two is a heavy progressive income tax. A progressive income tax means the more money you make, the higher the percentage. Do we have a progressive income tax in the United States? Yes. Can you say IRS? They don't put the percentages. They change it and they convert it. If you make between 5000 and 10000 this is how much you pay. You make between 10 and 15 this is how much you pay. And they give you the number. Well, get your calculator and figure it out. The more money you make, the higher the percentage. What do you think the highest percentage the IRS has ever collected. Right now, I think the top percent is about 33%. What do you think the maximum was that IRS has ever collected in history? 98%. 98%. How did you know that? I don't remember reading it somewhere. Okay. 
between 1941 and 1942, during World War II, there were some people who were taxed 98 percent. That's almost all. <laughs> How come we didn't have another American Revolution? The hell with the Germans. I'm going to get my gun and start fighting here. You're going to take 98% of my stuff? You're going to have to take it. If you think you're big enough to take it, come right on ahead. But I'm not going to give it up. That's ridiculous. Uh, about abolition of all rights of inheritance. If your parents die, the government is going to take half. Why? What did they do to get half? They just want to make sure that your parents don't leave you a million dollars so that you can get more and more money. It's a lot easier to become a multi-millionaire if mom and dad leave you one to start with. We don't want that to happen. Uh, confiscation of all property of immigrants and rebels. You ever fly internationally? You've got to fill out a card. If you're carrying more than $10,000, they'll take it. You want to leave the United States and go live someplace else? Goodbye. Leave all your money here. I have friends that want to move to New Zealand. They are trying to figure out a way to put their money in an offshore account so they can keep their money. A central bank. We're going to talk about the Federal Reserve. We can go right on down the line. Ten out of ten items in the Communist Manifesto are here in the United States right now. Did you know that you live in a communist country? Are you glad that you live in a communist country? What are you going to do about it? We've got to draw the line somewhere. Now, I don't have time to go into it in too much detail. However, I do have a videotape called The Ten Planks. It's a one-hour video, and it goes into a lot more detail on the Communist Manifesto. And you can get in touch with me, and I can give you one of those. Um,